Coming to order Monday, July the 26th, 2021. A uh, story that we're a little bit late. Uh, we had a, a closed meeting that went a little bit over. over. Um, so we're here now. Um, let's do a quick roll call. Uh, Councillor Van, uh, Councilor Foster. Present. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Present. Councillor McElwain. Present. Councillor Kittress. Present. Councillor Dunsmore. Present. Councilor McCray. Here. Okay, uh, we have nothing to uh, declare uh, to announce out of the closed meeting. Um, first thing on our agenda, number six, is presentations and announcements, and we're here, we're joined today by Paul Norris, the president of Ontario Water Power Association. Uh, I will turn it over to Paul. Uh, for Lynn, point of order. I'll go ahead, Councilor McCray. Um, disclosure of pecuniary interest. Oh, yes, I skipped by that nasty little thing. Okay, disclosure of pecuniary interest of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. So Councilor McCray. I, yeah. So uh, I'd just like to disclose I have a pecuniary interest in the following matter. Item 8.1, approval and adoption of Council 28th June 2021 minutes as part of the July 26, 2021 Council meeting. Uh, given my previous declaration of a conflict of interest at the 28th June 2021 Council meeting, I should not participate in the discussion of that meeting's minutes. Okay, thanks, Councilor McCray. We're, we'll make sure that uh, we uh, pay attention to that when we get to it. Um, did I miss anything else here? No, I don't think so. Okay, over to you, Paul, uh, Councilor Foster. Thank you, Mayor. Second point of order. Do we not have to approve the agenda before we start the meeting? No, our new procedural bylaw, um, uh, the laying out the agenda does not require that. Okay, uh, moving on to our presentation and over to you, uh, Mr. Norris. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. And, and at the outset, my apologies for, I uh, guess, my miscommunication for the last uh, meeting. I hadn't anticipated <clears throat> the time that you good folks spend and doing the, and the work of the municipality. And so I'm really pleased to be here today. I'm going to try to share my screen if that's okay. Unless yeah, you have sure. the presentation in front of you. Um, I think you've been made a host, so I think you should be able to share it. Okay. Um, does everybody have that? Not yet. No. Okay, let me see what's going on here. Uh, screen. Here's my PowerPoint. Still no? No, nothing yet, Paul. Well, that is unfortunate. Well, I'm sharing my screen. Let's try again. How's that? Yeah, there you go. There you We're go. Good. Thank you so much. My apologies for the technical uh, challenges. So I'm really pleased to be here um, uh, and to have the opportunity to, to speak with you good folks today. Again, my name is Paul Norris. I'm president of the Ontario Water Power Association and we're pleased to have the opportunity uh, to talk to you today and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing and working with uh, communities across the province and to invite you to be uh, one of those communities who expresses their support for our industry, which is, which is water power. Some of you may uh, know that as hydroelectricity, but uh, we're the Ontario Water Power Association and we refer to it as uh, water power. So I have a brief presentation and then I'm happy to take questions throughout or if there's some questions at the end of the presentation, please to entertain those as well. So uh, we're here to talk about uh, three opportunities for you to consider. Uh, one is what we've uh, created, which is the Ontario Water Power Champions Charter. So it's a templated uh, uh, document that we have created for consideration by municipalities across the province who want to express their support uh, for water power. 
Uh, the second opportunity you have is to join us uh, each year on June the 20th, which happens to be Sir Adam Beck's uh, birthday. Uh, we just celebrated Water Power Day uh, in Ontario again for the third or fourth time. Uh, there's actually a, a private member's bill in the legislature right now to formally proclaim uh, June 20th as Water Power Day in the province. And the last opportunity is, is for you to become a member of our organization and, and get the benefits of being part of the collective voice for uh, water power in the province of Ontario. And I'll go into some detail on, on each of those opportunities. So this is just an indication, and this is a little dated. Uh, a couple more communities have already uh, joined in the last couple of months of the communities across the province who have done what we're asking you to consider to do uh, today. So right across the province in, in the north, in the south, uh, in the east, and in the west, a number of communities have expressed their interest in becoming a supporter of water power. And from my view, um, considering that increasingly uh, electricity policy decisions are informed if not made by local municipalities and local governments. And I think that's only a trend that's going to increase over time. It's really, really important that we uh, speak with and have the opportunity to engage uh, communities such as yours in pretty significant uh, public policy decisions going forward, whether it's expressed through official plans, whether it's expressed uh, through um, resolutions of the municipalities. We think it's a, it's a hugely important opportunity for us to be engaged with the good work that you do at, at the local level. Just a little bit about uh, water power in the province of Ontario. We have over 200 operating hydro facilities, some of those that you'll be familiar with uh, in and around uh, your area, certainly. And they range in size from as uh, little as uh, the smallest one we have in operation right now is 35 kilowatts uh, up to and over a thousand megawatts of things like uh, Niagara Falls or, or Saunders um, uh, facilities. Um, they're spread right across the province. And if you, if you have a look at, at where they are and, and how they got there, what you'll find is that in Southern Ontario in particular, so I, when I say Southern Ontario, I'm talking south of the French Mattawa, um, you know, the communities uh, were first established, associated with the rivers in, in, across uh, southern Ontario, uh, first for transportation, then for mechanical generation, grist mills, sawmills, the like, and, and uh, in the late 1800s and for the last century for hydroelectric generation. And so it's really the, the story of settlement of southern Ontario. In the north, it's a little bit different. The north, many of the facilities, although uh, some of them are located in and around communities. Many of them were constructed to support industry, uh, the forest industry in particular, the mining industry is another good example. Uh, and it really is, again, uh, the settlement of the province of Ontario. And this will just give you kind of an overview of where we sit uh, in terms of uh, hydro in the province of Ontario. Uh, you might be interested to know that up until 1951, all the electricity generated in the province came from falling water. Uh, we made some public policy decisions in the 60s and 70s, uh, mostly to move to larger centralized generation, uh, first coal and then uh, nuclear. We are seeing a bit of a renaissance, uh, particularly in the small hydro business across the province. Uh, the breakdown is about 50-50 in Southern Ontario and Northern Ontario. And Ontario is relatively unique in many jurisdictions in as much as we have uh, uh, the large majority of our facilities being categorized as we would refer to as small hydro. So that's less than 10 megawatts and below. And you'll certainly be familiar with some of the facilities in and around your area. I did sit in on your last meeting and I think there was some reference made uh, to the Grand River Conservation Authority. They own and operate hydro facilities as, uh, as uh, uh, do other um, uh, entities across uh, the South. Uh, and, and Ontario really was the birthplace for small hydro. We exported much of our technical expertise uh, in the small hydro business uh, in the early 1940s, 1950s, and, and still continue to do so today. And the, the other important thing is that we last forever. Um, the majority of our facilities are over 50 years old, providing renewable, reliable electricity uh, for more than five decades. And in fact, uh, 35 or so of them have been producing continuously for more than a century. So while we're talking to you uh, today, in addition to the, the discussions we've had with other municipalities is uh, relatively recently, I think 2019, we undertook a public opinion survey to find out what people thought about hydroelectricity, about water power. 
and in the context of other sources of generation. And I'll be honest, when we went into this, uh, this um, uh, public opinion poll, we thought that, uh, that um, rural Ontario would be more supportive of hydro. And we thought that uh, older demographic would be more supportive of hydro just because of our history and the familiarity we thought that was in that geography or that demographic. What we found was, was quite surprising. We found that right across the province, no matter where you lived, and no matter what your demographic was, no matter what political party you associated with, there was strong support uh, for hydroelectricity. And perhaps more importantly, what we found, and this was quite different than other forms of generation, uh, we did a cross tabulation of the knowledge that an individual had about um, the source of electricity and the level of support. And we found that the more people knew about hydro, the more they supported it. And that led us quite frankly, to launch this initiative to seek for uh, seek community support for what we do and, and, and how we do it. This is my, what I call the best bang for the buck slide. I'm not gonna go through the details. Um, what you'll see is the various forms of generation that are in the province of Ontario. The top three bars uh, simply uh, illustrate the relative uh, capacity, uh, energy, uh, or uh, energy on demand that you get from each form of generation. Um, and the bottom number is how much that costs relative to uh, the form of generation you're talking about. And the thing that you'll notice, the thing that I notice when I look at this is that hydro is the only form of generation that that bottom number is lower than all of those top numbers. So cost versus value, uh, hydro is the best bang for the buck that we have in the province of Ontario and has been for, for decades. We just recently completed and featured at our, our conference uh, and socioeconomic evaluation of the potential impacts of investment on our existing 224 hydro facilities across the province. And what we found was that uh, investment in existing assets, so ongoing invest investment in existing assets, I'm not talking about new development here, just continuing to support those facilities that are in the ground now was about $500 million a year over the next five years supporting 5,000 jobs a year over the next five years. We think this is pretty critical in terms of our uh, hopeful <laughs> near-term uh, economic recovery from COVID. Um, and as you probably will guess, most of the investment that happens in hydro happens right here in Ontario. We estimate 80 to 85% of the investment that goes into an existing facility is local. So uh, the three things that I brought to your, uh, for your consideration today is, is the Champions Charter. So this is just uh, a, a declaration that the community, the municipality can sign uh, that indicates that they support uh, local water power. They support the uh, infrastructure that exists in the rede redevelopment uh, thereof, and that they are a community that is uh, interested in continued sustainable uh, development. So that's one mechanism that um, communities can uh, employ to help us get the word out with respect to uh, with respect to water power. Um, I talked a little bit before about uh, about um, uh, June twentieth as as Water Power Day. You could also continue becoming a, a member of our association. Um, the benefits of that is you get access to all of the benefits that all other members get, with the exception of, of voting at our AGM. But every, every Friday, you will get an update that tells you what's happening in the electricity sector in Ontario and beyond. Uh, you get preferred access to a number of our events, including our conference. It's held every year, starting again next year in Niagara in May. Um, you get access to members-only content, uh, and I'll give you an example of, of one of those. And um, you'll get access to all the data, the reports, and information that might be interesting uh, to you in the context of your um, um, your aspirations from a community perspective in terms of electricity supply and generation. This is that last one that I spoke of, uh, access to the, it's called the Water Power Reference Center. So this is geospatial GIS database that we've created. Um, it has existing hydro facilities and details about those. It has uh, uh, the 2000 hydro, undeveloped hydro, uh, uh, sites in Ontario. It has MNR infrastructure and the utilities. We partnered with the Federation of Ontario Cottages Association. We have a data layer that overlays cottages associations with hydro facilities and the municipal boundaries. And more recently, we've added the provincial electoral boundaries. 
So that uh, would be uh, accessible to you as, as a member of the association to use as you see fit in terms of perhaps land use planning or local electricity policy planning. And we just celebrated Water Power Day on uh, June the 20th. We provide all our supporting municipalities with social media um, messaging with uh, uh, updated information on what's happening on Water Power Day and opportunity to participate directly. Uh, and that's certainly something we'd make available to your municipality as well. So um, that's my overview. I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, on any aspect of, of what I've talked about or or anything that I didn't cover that you might be interested in. Great, thanks very much, Paul. Can you, uh, yeah, there we go. Perfect, now I can see people. Uh, any questions from council? Thanks for uh, coming and sharing us that information with us. Any questions from council? Council Kittress? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I was wondering if there were, uh, like your association has uh, new information on um, power generation other in rivers other than dams. Yeah, so I think what you're talking about there is something that's referred to as kinetic hydro. So uh, uses the, um, so, so maybe I'll just step back. Uh, the ability to produce energy or electricity from a river is a function of two things how far the water falls and how much water there is, right? So Niagara Falls, the, the, the head and, and the flow. Um, but yeah, there is emergent technology that focuses specifically on the flow of a river. Uh, so that's called kinetic hydro. And most of the major manufacturers, whether you know, the turbine manufacturers are, uh, are developing or have developed um, uh, technologies that can take advantage of that. You, you, would, we, you would never get to the same Kind of magnitude of in terms of, of energy um, uh, energy uh, develop, but certainly it has practical application for you know, local uh, use or off grid use. Um, but yeah, we, we, that's certainly a technology that's come a long way in the last ten years. Thanks, Paul. Any other questions? Great, thanks uh, for coming in and sharing those, that presentation with us today, and appreciate um, you taking the time. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thanks. Feel free to stay if you'd like. Uh, 6 2, um, uh, County Council report. I have nothing to report. Um, County Council doesn't uh, meet in uh, July or August, so I'll come with a county report in September. Uh, committee updates. Um, we'll go around the room. Uh, Councillor McCray, anything? Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, there were no meetings this month. Councillor Dunsmore? Uh, nothing to report, although there were two meetings. I was on vacation for both of them. Councillor Kittress? Councillor McElwain? Um, the BIA meeting this, this month, um, they uh, were talking about putting together the case for street closure for 2022 summer. And uh, so that's something that'll be coming to council about sometime in the future, but other than that, uh, nothing really very new. Councilor Van Loon? No, nothing to report today, thanks. Councilor Foster? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, no substantive report. Everyone recalls Center Wellington Hydro reported just last meeting. Uh, seniors activities are ongoing. Um, nothing uh, substantive that needs reporting. Thank you. Thanks, councillors. Uh, moving to approval and adoption of the minutes. Uh, we have uh, minutes from our council meeting June the 28th. So I have a recommendation that the minutes of the council meeting held June 28th, 2021 be adopted as circulated. Mover for that, please. Councillor Dunsmore, second by Councillor Van Leeuwen. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Moving on to report from Committee of the Whole. Um, 
Uh, we have a recommendation of the Council of the Township of Center Wellington approve the report from the Committee of the Whole dated July 19th, 2021 as circulated. Mover for that, please. Councillor McElwain, seconded by Councillor Dunsmore. Any questions about that? All in favor? And that's carried. No delegations uh, today. Uh, getting on to consideration of reports, item 11. Uh, we have the tax incremental equivalent grant for Laura South Incorporated. And we have um, several people here. And I, I know we're going to start off with uh, our managing director of corporate services and treasurer, but this is a bit of a team effort. So we do have uh, Dan going to be speaking. We also have uh, here to support Dan is Luciano. Uh, the president of RCI Consulting, who's helped uh, the township with the CIP uh, uh, Teague process, and he can help uh, respond to any questions. We also have uh, Aaron Ciccone and Steve Fletcher from Pearl Hospitality uh, here as well um, as, as delegations. And we also have another delegation, uh, Vince Agostino, so he'll be speaking as well. So a few things on the agenda. First up, though, I will turn it over to our managing director, uh, Dan Wilson. Welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton. I'm going to uh, share my screen and go through a presentation. Hopefully that has uh, come up okay. Okay, um, report COR 2021-41, Tax Increment Equivalent Grant for Alora South. Um, I'm going to start off by going through just a very high level concepts on how a, a CIP or a community improvement plan works. Um, as you know, the township does have a CIP uh, and this is one of the very few tools that municipalities have that allows us to provide incentives. In this case, we're encouraging investment in a, a key area of the township without getting into trouble with the Municipal Act or causing any undue advantages to, to one business to, in comparison to another business. Um, a CIP allows you to have a consistent approach of, of meeting the terms and conditions of a community improvement plan and have a consistent application of that plan to, to applicants. Um, so from a township perspective, we have two different levels of incentives. Uh, level one incentives are more or less dealt with at a staff level. Um, we typically look, see um, facade improvement grants and loans come forward at a staff level and, and obviously seek uh, budget direction from, from council every year as part of the budget process. Um, but what we're talking about today is a level two incentive, which are approved by council and uh, are actually based on priority sites that were already pre-approved by council as well. Um, so we are here to talk about the tax increment equivalent grant or the TIG. Um, but there are also other level two incentives, uh, Brownfield financial assistance, uh, level two building improvement grants and loans. And uh, we give a few examples at the bottom of the slide of, of, of level two incentives that have gone through council in the last few years. So when it comes to the TIG, um, there are two major requirements and, and these are the requirements that are really in place for all level two incentives. Um, you must have substantial development, redevelopment, or rehabilitation of an eligible building or property within the township's urban center. Uh, and it also must be deemed a priority site by council. Um, and we do have over 20 approved priority sites that have gone through the council approval process already. Um, and the criteria to get on those sites um, to make its way to council for approval, um, Grand River Frontage, uh, Brownfield property, um, a vacant or unutilized site that requires significant uh, development or redevelopment, and then a site that is subject to proposal that assists in achieving targets uh, and policies through the provincial growth plan. Um, so, so you have to meet um, one of those um, criteria in order to be um, considered for a priority site, and then they would come to forward, forward to council uh, for approval as a priority site. So the purpose of a TIG, a tax increment equivalent grant, is to defer property taxes, um, defer property tax increases for a period of time in order to assist in financing a substantial property redevelopment or development or improvement. Um, and I do like to point out that 
it's it's not really a grant. It, it acts more like a rebate program because we do require the property owner to pay taxes in full. Um, and then once taxes are approved uh, or, or once taxes are paid in full, then we um, provide the TIG payment back in that year after the fact. So, so it does act more like a rebate program than, than a grant program. Um, and it does only apply to the tax increment. Um, so what I mean by tax increment, it's, it's the increase in taxation as a result of the development or redevelopment. Um, and, I, and I do want to clarify, um, it's, it's based on the tax increase as assessed by MPAC, the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. Um, it's, it's not based on what's planned to be developed. Um, it's, a, it's, it's calculated based on what is developed um, and what is assessed by MPAC after the development is complete and the change in taxation from just prior to, to development to just post-development after MPAC has completed their assessment. Um, so tax increment equivalent grants are not unique to Centre Wellington. A lot of municipalities um, have this tax incentive program in their CIPs. Um, and I guess I do wanna point out as it's treated like a rebate program, there is no payment of interest. Um, any interest earned from the point in time we receive taxes to the point where we pay out the TIG is, is kept by, by the township. So now looking specifically at the Alora South site, um, it, it has been identified already as a priority site by, by Township Council uh, that was completed in 2015. Um, there is an application currently in place for a, a TIG for, for the Alora South site, uh, a seven phase development and um, um, we can see what the seven phases are within my report and within the attachment to the report. Um, they do have listed eligible costs that far exceed the estimated TIG payments for the development of the site. And uh, I do refer in my report to the types of costs that are eligible um, as part of the TIG program. And it's, it's more or less based on section 28 of the Planning Act. Um, we do have a mixed use development application. And what I mean by that is it's considered one application for the whole site where there's a combination of, of uh, residential and commercial development. Um, and, and the assessed value of the site is currently around $2 million and it is anticipated to go up to approximately 130 million. So that's, that's quite a significant um, increase in, in the assessment base for the township to, to have that one property go up by um, 128 plus million dollars as a result of, of redevelopment. In terms of the calculation itself, and this is for the township's purpose laid out specifically in, in the CIP, so we remain consistent from one application to the next. Um, the township provides 80% of the tax increment for 10 years. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, that's the 80% of the increase in taxation as a result of the redevelopment um, over a 10 year period. Um, the, the Laura South property is looking at seven different phases, so it would be um, the tax increment by phase, so we wouldn't have the entire application process spanning one 10 year period, it would be seven different 10 year periods that are more or less overlapping. Uh, the county does have a, a TIG program um, as part of this, uh, they have a sliding scale over five years. Uh, going from 100% in, in year one down to 20% in, in year five. And, and the table at the bottom of this slide shows potential tax increment uh, based on um, the $130 million proposed or estimated assessment for, for the property. Uh, we currently receive from a township point of view, just township taxation, uh, just under $11,000 for this entire site. Um, based on the $130 million estimated assessment, that would go up to approximately $487,000, uh, which gives you a tax increment of roughly $476,000, $477,000. Uh, so just from a point of context for the township's perspective, $476,000 is equivalent to about a 3.2% increase in taxation. So again, having that much impact on one development site is, is fairly unique, especially for, for the township. So I mentioned that uh, the, the TIG has seven different phases and, and each phase has a, a 10 year payment of, of the township TIG. Um, just to give an idea of, of scope over, over the timeline here, um, 
as, as you can see from the report itself, uh, we're looking at um, um, a potential phased approach to development of this site of up to 15 years. Uh, if you take a 15 year phased approach, assuming that the last phase complete is completed in year 15, it means an additional 10 years of TIG payments on that last phase. So that could be looking at uh, around a 25 year implementation period for, for this TIG application, um, which, is, which is a fairly significant period. Um, the, the table at the bottom of this slide shows, if you look at the very bottom of, of the table, um, if the entire development and the TIG process takes 25 years, yes, we're, we would pay approximately 3.8 million in TIG payments, but over that period of time, we're looking at almost $10 million in, in township taxation um, uh, based on assumptions of, of phase in over the 15 year period. Uh, but about $10 million in taxation, township taxation, as a result of this development. So $3.8 million of that would go back to the applicant in the form of a TIG over, over that 25-year period, uh, which means the township would retain over $6 million in new taxation that is currently not receiving. Um, so that, again, is, is, is fairly significant. Um, if the applicant doesn't use the entire 15 years to develop, say they use... Um, 10 years to develop and an additional 10 years to pay the TIG, then the 20 year column would, would take effect where we'd bring in about $8 million in taxes, 3.8 million of that being TIG payments, um, netting to the township of about $4.2 million that the township would keep. So again, fairly, fairly significant. Uh, the top row is showing 15 years <clears throat> that would require the applicant to build the whole site in a five year period, which um, may or may not be realistic. Um, before I move on to the next slide, I just want to point out the 3.8 million in TIG payments, again, is, is very high level estimates at this point. Um, I, I'll say it again, it, it depends on what is actually built um, and it depends on the assessed value as determined by MPAC to determine what the actual TIG balance may be. So a lot can happen over a 15 to 25 year period. So we'll build the TIG uh, application and the, the TIG agreement to ensure that the calculations are based on what is actually built, not as what, what is proposed to be built at this time. <clears throat> so with, with this uh, development and, and just relying specifically on, on the TIG itself, um, the benefits to the township, there are obviously significant benefits from a taxation and assessment point of view, um, not only after the TIG is fully paid, but you can, as you can see from the previous slide, even while the TIG is being paid to the applicant, there are significant benefits to the township in terms of taxation assessment and tax funding um, that, that greatly assist the township over the long term. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, having, having taxation increase equivalent to 3.2% increase in taxation in today's dollars is, is quite significant. Um, we are, in this case, developing a underutilized brownfield site along the Grand River, which is a lot of the key points that are actually outlined in our CIP as, as, as criteria for a priority two site. And obviously there's significant economic benefits to, to this development in terms of new commercial within, within Center Wellington, uh, significant new jobs uh, as a result of the development as well as the impacts on tourism. And uh, one last slide, some of the um, conditions that uh, we're currently working with Luciano on in, in terms of the draft um, TIG agreement that's currently in development. Um, the first one is that the Alora South site would uh, be developed over a maximum of 15 years. And we referred to that earlier in some of the calculations. Um, number two, I've stressed a few times in this presentation, the TIG will be based on actual assessed values as determined by MPAC immediately following the development of each phase. So again, it, it doesn't matter what's currently proposed. It, it matters at the end of the day as what, as what is actually developed and, and goes through the development approval process. Uh, the TIG will be based on township and county taxation only. Um, um, as my um, report alludes to, we need a separate agreement between the township and the county itself to, to handle the, the county portion of, of the TIG. Uh, so no, no TIG um, calculations will be done on education tax rates. Um, the, the TIG will be paid annually over 10 years for each phase. 
um, and there's specific conditions that must be met before that payment is made each year. And, and I mentioned earlier, one of the more significant conditions is that taxation must be paid in full on, on the property before the TIG payment is, is made in that given year. Uh, the TIG payments can't exceed the total eligible costs for each phase of the development. And, and as I said earlier, the types of eligible costs are referred to in my report. And any new construction or development outside of the TIG program and the application itself is not included in the TIG calculation. So if, if the applicant decides to do something further, uh, that would not be included in, in the TIG program. Uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. I believe I am going to turn the floor over to Luciano for his comments. Welcome, Luciano. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dan, for that presentation. So uh, what I'm going to do today is just talk a little bit about the agreement that's uh, that's being developed and uh, the process of, um, of developing that agreement. In terms of my background, I've been preparing community improvement plans and associated administration materials, uh, such as tax increment grant agreements, program guides, application forms, and even conducting uh, municipal staff training on these various um, materials for about 20 years now. Um, I prepared the first TIG agreement for a brownfield site redevelopment in Ontario way back in, in 2001. And I've been involved as a consultant for many years now in preparing these agreements for municipalities all across Ontario and also reviewing these agreements on behalf of my developer clients. So um, during that time, I've continued to refine and update these agreements and uh, to include best practices. And certainly working on these agreements from both the municipal perspective and the developer's perspective has helped me to understand the balance, the clarity and the safeguards required for a reliable and fair agreement. Obviously these agreements have to be fair, um, but they also have to be uh, successfully implemented. And uh, that's something that we try to make sure that's in the agreement so that it's clear, everyone understands it and that everyone knows what's going to happen if the developer defaults on the agreement in terms of the township's response. And I think we've, we've done that with this agreement. So what I was asked by the township to do was to assist staff in preparing the agreement for Laura South, uh, including drafting of parts of the agreement and discussions with the developers around the terms of the agreement. Um, as Dan mentioned, this is a very large, by any standard in any community, this is a large multi-use, multi-phase development proposal. It's much more complex than Alora North, for example. And therefore it uh, necessitates a more complex and detailed tax increment grant agreement. Um, yet the agreement still has to, even if it's complex and it's multi-phase, it has to be clear and understandable for all parties. And that again is what we've tried to accomplish. Um, my role was simply again, to work with staff and the developer to uh, develop and refine this agreement so that it's clear, acceptable to both parties and contains the safeguards and protections required by the township so that it can protect its financial and other interests uh, in approving the application and implementing the agreement. In terms of the agreement itself, it's divided into several sections. That includes a definition of the terms used in the agreement, how the grant will be calculated and paid by the township. Uh, it includes numerous conditions that must be met by the developer prior to the grant being paid, uh, including construction start and completion deadlines for each phase of development so that the township can ensure that the project is, uh, is progressing properly and um, completion of each time, uh, each phase and the development as a whole. So the requirements, uh, there's also requirements in there for documentation to be submitted by the developer, including status reports. Uh, the township has rights uh, to have staff inspect the development. There are re reliance and compliance statements, including adherence to all applicable legislation, regulations, municipal bylaws, work orders, and other requirements. There are clauses to indemnify the township, including its officers and employees from any claims arising from the township entering into the agreement. And there's an extensive section in the agreement on what constitutes a default. Uh, default by the developer. Uh, this section includes the township's rights to permit the developer to rectify the default and the township's rights to delay or cease any grant payments, require repayment of any grant payments that have already been made to the developer, or even terminate the agreement if that is deemed necessary by the township. So in summary, I'm confident that uh, the agreement that's being developed uh, for this application is detailed, clear, 
fair and provides the township with the tools and safeguards that it needs to properly administer the grant over the life of the proposed project. Um, that uh, is, is it for my comments. I do want to uh, thank you, thank the staff at the township, including Brett Salmon, Dan Wilson, and Andy Goldie uh, for their um, assistance and guidance uh, in developing this agreement. It's been a pleasure to work with them. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Luciano, and uh, thanks for working with our team on this. Um, we have two delegations uh, registered for this. The first is Aaron Ciccone, um, the pro from Pro Hospitality. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, Council. And uh, thank you for the opportunity today to discuss our next phase of the project. Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, uh, my name is Aaron Ciccone. I'm the president of Pro Hospitality and the owner of Allure South and uh, Allure North. Uh, I'm here today to express my support uh, for the Allure Mill South TIG agreement. Over the years, we've learned how essential TIG programs are to encourage positive community development uh, in the community. It's a program that doesn't take away from the existing tax dollars, but instead uses future generated tax dollars to assist the development of projects that will benefit the town. The TIG program allows us to construct these buildings that will generate the new tax revenue dollars for the municipality, but also encourages us to build the infrastructure required, the new public spaces, and to clean up the contamination on the site. One of these public spaces is the Potter Rooms, which is very close to completion. With other projects, such as the walking trail systems or the river walk currently, in the planning stage. The Allura Mill team takes pride in collaborating and working with the community to create projects that will benefit all the residents and the businesses of Allura. As the community knows, the restoration of the Allura Mill is a testament to how our commitment to maintaining the unique historical and architectural fabric of Allura. The Allura Mill was a multi-year, incredibly complex development that required many levels of cooperation and collaboration that happened in concert. The Allure South project, similarly complex, will also require uh, an alignment from many partners, such as this TIG program. Once completed, like the mill, the South side will, will be a community-wide effort with community benefits. We look forward to building and developing this, new, this next phase that is both unique and in keeping with the rich and beautiful traditions of Alora. Thank you for your time today and for considering the TIG proposal that will help us build more infrastructure, developing these new public spaces and cleaning up the contaminated sites. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, moving on to our second delegation, Vin Vince Agostino. Welcome, Vince. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Linton and councillors. It's been four weeks since our June 30th, 2021 council meeting, where citizens were given the opportunity to voice their opinions. The mayor and councillors heard for themselves the, the resounding opposition to Pearl's proposed plans for Allura South and the citizens' passion for protecting the Allura Heritage Area. It's more important now than ever that the citizens' voices resonate with the mayor and councillors. Here we are 28 short days later, and Pearl is asking for millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to use for growth plans that the citizens oppose. Pearl clearly would have known on the 30th of June, 2021, that their Allura South development plan was cost prohibitive. Why did Pearl not disclose at the public meeting that their Allura South development was cost prohibitive? The answer is obvious, <clears throat> excuse me. The answer is obvious. How can Pearl possibly ask for money from the very same people that are voicing their resounding opposition to their plans? They strategize that it's better to separate the two issues by a few weeks and are trying quickly to get the grant approved. Why the big rush to push through a request for such a substantial amount of taxpayer money without the mayor, councillors, and citizens 
having the opportunity to do their due diligence? The answer is because the project has become cost prohibitive. This does not pass the smell test for us. From an article in last week's, um, from an article in last week's uh, Elora Fergus Today, the report reads, the purpose of the grant program is to defer a property tax increase in order to help finance, finance substantial property improvements that would otherwise be cost prohibitive by a property owner. This is a classic play on words. Let's really analyze that short sentence. Our first question is, substantial property improvements for who? Not the citizens that you heard from, not the citizens that have been polled, not the vast majority of citizens that are speaking out against this and now being asked to help to pay for it. That is simply a false statement used to try and sell us a fake bag of goods. Secondly, notice the wording cost prohibitive to the property owner. Cost prohibitive simply means that you cannot afford something. Is Pearl actually asking the pay taxpayers to subsidize buildings higher than three stories and subsidize luxury apartments? Wouldn't this set an inappropriate precedent for other developers to do the same? Why should we help subsidize Pearl's luxury development, which would actually be unaffordable to the average working person and has been resoundingly rejected by the community? We are pro-appropriate development. We are pro-growth and we are pro-affordable housing. You are making it appear as though these plans being sought, not just by Pearl, but now by other developers who are buying up properties in the Lord Elora Heritage area are inevitable. What you are actually doing is trying to force it upon the citizens who are seeing through all of this. We have major housing developments starting immediately adjacent to the heritage area, proof that there are better options. We can develop and we can grow and we can also protect. You cannot ignore the fact that there are alternatives which can achieve the same goals and objectives for growth and development while still protecting the Elora Heritage area. The credibility, the credibility of Pearl is being questioned. Our hope is that the mayor and councillors don't follow their same path and truly listen to their constituents so as to keep their own credibility intact and secure their legacy by doing the right thing in this upcoming election year, which is allowing for development and growth while at the same time protecting the Elora Heritage area. I oppose Pearl's request for more of the taxpayers' money on the basis that Pearl's withdrawal last week of the planning application for the 2021 Elora South Master Plan makes their calculations speculative and their application premature for any tax grant. How can township staff possibly recommend this grant without Elora South Inc. providing council and members of the public with all of the promised information. What criteria has township staff used to come to this decision? I have read Mr. Jackson's written submission, raising parking issues and requesting deferral of this tax grant, and I agree and support it. The issue of the tax increment equivalent grant is being recommended by township staff must be deferred by council. Until council and citizens have had a fair chance to review all of the details of Pearl's revised Laura South Master Plan, which Councillor McRae, Councillor Dunsmore, and Councillor McElwain got Pearl to promise to provide to decision makers and members of the public. That was going to be the end of my statement today until I read something earlier this morning. I read Pearl's comments today in reply to Bob Jackson's and my interview with Laura Fergus today. Let's be perfectly clear. There is a big difference between the mill project and the proposed Laura South plans. The mill was a restoration project of a very significant Laura landmark, which included a, tax a taxpayer funded government grant of $1.5 million. 
it's not a proper comparison to make because the Alora South project includes luxury condominiums and apartments. We are keeping our focus on the Alora South project and we continue to make our voices heard as our support continues to grow. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thanks, Vince, and uh, thanks, Aaron, for those delegations. I will turn it to members of council for uh, your comments and, uh, and qu any questions that you might have, starting with Councillor Foster. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mayor. First of all, I, I would like to call for a recorded vote on this issue. Um, uh, secondly, my comments, um, I've been listening closely and I, I believe this application is premature. And it's premature because we don't have full uh, information. Uh, one of our delegations has pointed out, as we all know, the application was withdrawn on June 30th. And yet here we are a few weeks later uh, discussing tax relief for, for an application that's already been withdrawn. Um, it's premature because the project keeps changing. What, what was uh, discussed in 2013 did not include a flat iron building. It did not include a parking garage. This is two of the many, many ways that this keeps changing, like quicksand. Most of all, it's, it's going to be difficult to determine whether the project is eligible for CIP funding when we don't know what the project actually is or is going to be. And for all of these reasons, this is premature and I think it needs to be deferred until we know what the project is, until we have site plan approval, until we have full and accurate details on, on what is being proposed. How can we possibly consider tax relief in such a vacuum of information? So those are my introductory comments, Mayor. I, I look forward to hearing others as well. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thanks and through your mayor. Um, yeah, I, I try to go back right to when we first created the CIP programs and the TIGS uh, granting and, and what, the, what the whole purpose of it was. And some of, the, uh, of it was really to ensure that the community, um, like we filled this toolbox for a purpose to ensure that the community, we can, we can grow the community in a good way but also to ensure that the community can survive. So we had a lot of downtown uh, core programs like the facade programs in the CIPs. But with this TIG program, way back when we started in it, we always spoke about the fact that Elora downtown had a difficult time surviving. And what can we do to ensure that somehow we get more development, uh, businesses have, have more customers, um, and realistically, what can we do to ensure that we get the tax base uh, growing in that Allura community? So I'm trying to roll myself backwards, remembering that now that we've, we've at this point, it's easy to say, hey, you know what? We're not going to, uh, to roll out some of those packages because we are starting to see momentum. But realistically, this was all part of our process uh, to look at it and say, how can we develop how can we encourage downtown core business, downtown uh, living, uh, less transportation, all different things. So the, the, the TIG fits into our original plan and it's why we placed it there to, to speak about a good a community that, uh, that is all wrapped together in the downtown core there. So I, I'm interested in listening to some of the, the other um, counselors and what they have to say but at this point we really do want to ensure that uh, that we continue to see this growth that the restaurants in the downtown core can survive we had so many problems with with stores closing previously and uh, and I think that this allows goes back to our original plan and allows us to say let's let's keep this rolling and let's get this development continued Councillor McQueen Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I when uh, the TIG was uh, brought forward, um, even even when we originally brought it forward back in 2010 with the proposed CIP, um, 
this property is basically the ideal ideal uh, location for a Teague. Uh, it's uh, it's a brownfield that needed to be developed, and uh, and what Pearl is doing there fits exactly in what we wanted it to do. Um, I the, the fear of we don't know exactly what's going to happen yet with the phase that came forward a month ago. Uh, you're right, we don't. But if nothing gets developed there ever, um, then there won't be any payment for that for it. I mean, it's only based upon impact assessment. So um, I don't see any reason why we would not approve uh, going forward with this TIG. We don't know that the 3.8 million is a big number. And if it was a, if it was a single payment tomorrow afternoon, then we could all sit back and say, ooh, that's too much. And nobody deserves that kind of big check. But that isn't what we're offering. We're offering a payment each year over a 10 year period um, based upon the development that comes forward on the, uh, each year and, and the impact assessment. So, um, and the work has already started. Um, there's, as Aaron pointed out, there's already work been done and, uh, and the assessment on the property will have gone up just based upon that work to date. So um, I don't see any logical reason why we would not approve this payment uh, pro program as it was uh, uh, promoted today. Councilor Kittress. Um, thank you, Mayor. I have some questions. Um, before I make a comment, uh, I was wondering if I could ask those questions first. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering what percentage of the condos have been sold and um, when they're sold to the public, will they be paying the full taxes or subsidized taxes. And then my I have a third question. Sorry, the, I just want to cut you off on the first question. That's out of scope for our discussion today. So go on to the next the next question. Um, okay, uh, when when the when the condos are sold with the pub will, to the public, will they pay the full taxes or be subsidized? Like the residents? Dan, can you handle that one? Yes, uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Linton, the, the owners of the condos will pay full taxes. Councilor Kittress, follow on. You're still muted. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was wondering what the environmental costs to date have been and what are the future costs estimated? So I, I'm not sure who's gonna answer that one. Um, I don't see where that falls within the scope of this discussion. Um, it's a brownfield. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a brownfield. That's that. Uh, Dan, do you have any sense of that? Like, I don't know where that fits in this discussion. Um, through you, Marilyn, to not, not, it's not information I have at this time. No. And any other additional questions, Councillor Kittress? I guess I'll make my comments. Um, my, my view on this, since I can't get any answers on some of the things, and I've been disallowed to have the answers on those things. I have concerns about this um, being... I guess preferential because I don't know where where the where the potential of sales are or where the money. Um, the CIP is when there is an undeveloped um, area that there are no known sources of income, 
potentially coming from it. Um, I believe that there is uh, income potentially for this. And I think that um, to have tax subsidies at this time without all the information as was said by one of the delegations, and also, I would like to point out that we did no DC charges for uh, Mill Street West, which cost the taxpayer over 1.5 million. We did no DC charges for Victoria Street Pedestrian Bridge, which is McDonald Bridge, which was 3.2 million. We sold the property, uh, waterfront property, a uh, parking lot for another parking lot and Ross Street. And the price of the environmental costs were part of that price difference. And so we've already included all these environmental costs in that price sale, which was only $167,000 for the exchange and is worth millions of dollars because it's waterfront. Um, We've already given a TIG on, a, on the Mill Street North, which was a total fantastic, amazing redevelopment of, of the mill and heritage. And, you know, when it was just starting out and people were wondering how it was going to start, um, we waived parkland for already. Uh, Laura South for the trails, but we don't know what they all are. And um, they've already received a 1.5 million grant. So I think that this is not a site that is hurting for money. They, um, they have um, potentials, vast potentials. They've already pointed out what their potentials are and they should, I, I still think we, we need to know more information before we give another free lunch. Uh, and that's sort of the thing we're, we're, we're discussing here. I think when somebody, a lot of the other ones where we've given is we, there was not, no, you couldn't see the potential. You couldn't see. If you look in a Laura, there isn't everything, everybody is just gobbling up land and they're and they're they see the potential already they see the the it's not if you go to fergus it's a little different um but this area here the program and the help that we've already given has been successful and it's moving forward and we can't ask every developer multiple times to give uh, these these tags for I, I just sort of feel that we've done our part. We've helped um, Pearl Hospitality uh, do the great job that they're doing, and I think that without the further information that the citizens wanted um, about like parking and all the design stuff and the site, like I don't think I think we need to look at this. This is a little too preliminary, and I, I think that. Without that information, I'm not for this. I think that we are negligent in doing our duties here of, of having full information to make the decision. And I mean, there's some information that was disallowed by me just recently. So. Yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, Councillor Dunsmore? Yeah, I'm gonna <clears throat> start my questions with uh, Luciano, if I could, because he's a, involved in these TIGs throughout other municipalities across the province. So when they develop these policies, they select sites, put them on the list. And then when developers purchase those sites, it doesn't matter who the developer is, they get the TIG grant when it comes to those sites, if those sites are on the list. Am I correct in that? Uh, through the mayor, in response to that question, other municipalities, when they develop their community improvement plans, just as the township did, will identify areas, geographic areas, or sites. And what they do is when they receive an application, that application is reviewed and vetted by staff. Staff will then make a recommendation report to council. Council will make a decision on that report. That process is pretty standard 
from municipality to municipality. And I've seen these grants range anywhere from, you know, small amounts up to, I've had clients where we've, we've uh, gotten four and a half, five million, even a bit more. It all depends on the size of the project. Okay, thank you. Dan, can you tell me this agreement was put in place by council in 2015 and it listed sites within the township that were part of this program. Are there other sites other than the Elora North and Elora South that were on that? Uh, yes, uh, through Mayor Linton, um, I believe there are over 20 approved priority sites at this point. Uh, Brett can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so there are multiple sites that are eligible for level two incentives, including the TIG. Have, have there been any that were purchased already that we've granted grants to? Uh, through, through Mayor Linton, um, the only other TIG that is in place right now is for Lauren North, um, but okay. I can say there are there have been discussions about other properties um, that just haven't happened yet. Okay, so it, it's, it's my concern that we treat when we put these properties on the list and the properties are purchased for development with the expectation that there'll be some kind of a TIG for us to change a policy that was established by a council, not by staff, but by a council in 2015. And to start making changes to that now, because it's Pearl Hospitality or it's Elora South and, and people don't like them, that's a nasty road to go down in my book. These are grants that were already established. They're trying to play by the rules of the grants that were already established. We were getting $11,000 a year on this property, and now we're going to get far more. And when it's over, as we've heard already, the people who buy those condos will be paying the full taxes on them when this agreement runs its course. So there is a huge uh, tax base coming to us for this. That's why you put these properties on the list. And for that reason, we, we established a program in 2015, and I think we need to be honest and ethical and abide by that program whether people like the people who are developing it or not. Councilor McCray. Thank you, Marilyn. I grew up here. So over the years, I've watched the Southlands and how they deteriorated over the years. So it's refreshing to have a developer from outside of the community willing to come in and invest to develop the lands, to turn into something that is more appealing to the general public, not only visitors who come to Lord, but those of us who live here. I mean, some of the things that we're promising in terms of going with the TIG is that the developer can rely on having an agreement with the community that we support, having him continue with his development, that he can rely on getting some financial support back in terms of receiving back some of the property taxes, which I think is entirely appropriate. Furthermore, since at least 2002, if not before, there have been discussions regarding what to do with these lands. And it was all about increased densification, um, looking for, uh, to address the places to grow, having mixed use development. So the developer is doing all of what we've requested in our official plan amendment for that site. Discussions that went on back in 2002. I mean, one of the other things that I see from this is that the site will also have very little operating costs for the township, unlike other de developments as the roads and open space are all privately owned with certain public easements to allow for the public to walk the Riverside Trail. We don't have to pay for any of that upkeep to use that trail. Other types of development come with increased operating costs annually and long-term replacement costs for roads, parks, et cetera, that the township has to pay for. So in fact, taxpayers of Center Wellington are gonna get a tremendous benefit from this development. So quite frankly, I think um, supporting the TIG is the best way to go. It is a win-win situation long-term for the entire community. Thanks, councillors. Um, before I have a few comments, uh, before I do, I want um, our, our, our uh, treasurer to just to, um, talk a little bit about what I've heard a, uh, mentioned a couple of times, a tax subsidy. And I, and I don't understand where that term is coming up and I don't think it's accurate. Um, Dan, if you could just talk a little bit about how this isn't a tax subsidy, that would be great. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, no, this is definitely not a tax subsidy. Um, it, it's basically looking at providing a rebate for 
part of the increase in taxation as a result of the development. So um, this is taxation dollars that we're currently not receiving. Um, so it's not impacting taxes currently being paid to the township. It, it's looking at the future ability of, of taxes to be generated from the site and providing a portion of that back to the developer as an incentive. Um, so it's like I said earlier, it's the developer is required to pay full taxes each and every year. And then only when that is complete, um, the, the TIG rebate or TIG grant would be paid back to, to the developer. So it's a, it's a net increase in taxation to the township either way um, and a more substantial increase in taxation once the TIG program is complete. So tax taxpayers in Center Wellington are not paying for this work to be done. That is correct. Thanks for that clarification. A couple comments that I have, um, you know, this in on December the 12th, 2016 um, is when council was asked to um, provide a TIG agreement for a Laura North. Um, and we had significant discussion and, and Brett Salmon led that discussion back uh, in 2016. Um, and we had significant discussion about um, some of the things that actually that we're talking about today. Um, and since that time, uh, Council has identified priority sites across Centre Wellington that have certain, have certain features, have, meet certain criteria. And they're, they're included in the report the Council has before them. One has frontage along the Grand River. Uh, check that box. Is a known brownfield property. Um, you don't you don't have to have lived in Alora for more than 10 years to recognize that that is a, a former ugly industrial site across the river. Um, the the site is another criteria. The site is vacant or unutilized and has potential for significant development redevelopment. Check that box. Uh, the building is the site of a significant heritage value. Check that off. You just have to see uh, the work that uh, Pearl Hospitality has done on rebuilding the ruins to recognize that they have, uh, uh, they take seriously uh, retaining the heritage of, of Alora. Um, so these key criteria is what council used to establish the priority sites in the first place. And, and that's, that's what we're being asked to uh, ask for today. We, we've established the, the TIG process and that, was, and that was agreed to by council that we wanted a TIG process because we wanted to incent a certain kind of behavior from developments. And that is exactly what this, what this project is doing. We establish the rules as council, that's what council does, establishes the rules. And then we look at each individual property and identify, does this project meet the criteria that we set up? And as, it's, as Dan's laid out in the report, it does. Um, so I, I agree with some of the some of the councillors that we've already established that this is something that meets the criteria to put this TIG in place. Um, so I think uh, this is something that is that is really important. Um, it's it's something that council has already identified as as being a priority, um, and now we just have to follow through with what we established in the first place. Is that we want to make sure that we're we're providing incentives and we're encouraging the right kind of development in the right areas. And recognizing that a lot of these areas as Councillor McRae identified is there's gonna be some really, really attractive and well-used uh, public spaces that are gonna be used by locals and visitors alike. Um, so I'm, I'm very, and nothing's changed for me since uh, we put this on a priority site. There was reasons for it then and nothing has changed since, since then. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very in favor of, of moving ahead with something that um, is this positive. Um, but I would like to give, um, before we go around and give the councillors another opportunity, there have been some things that have been said. I would like to give uh, uh, Aaron an opportunity as the applicant to respond um, to, to anything that he heard that was said, and then we'll go around the room. I'll, I'll read the recommendation. We'll go around the room one more time. Aaron. Thank you, Mayor. And just a couple of points I wanted to, uh, to make on some of the comments. Um, one is this TIG program has been in place for many years before the condos uh, went for sale. Uh, so I think that's a really important point uh, to add there. We, since 2014, since uh, council approved our zoning application, the one that we are currently working with today, uh, we've been working on how do we build these 
public amenities into the into the Southside program. So this is not a new concept. And in 2014, there was a huge overwhelming response from the public saying, we'd like to see a public trail come through. Uh, we'd like to see how we can get down to the river. We, you know, we don't, we wanna see the Potter ruins restored. There, there was a list that came out from that and that's what we're doing. So I wanna be really clear on that, that we're, we're following through with saying, how can we actually build these non-revenue generating public spaces to say, how do we fund and, and keep this going? We've already shown and demonstrated with the Potter Rooms that we, we've started with this as another demonstration to show that our commitment to the, to the community. So I, I just want to be clear on that. And as far as who's paying taxes on the South side, everyone's paying taxes. Whether you're a condo buyer, whether you're a lower South as us as, as the remaining owners, whether you're a tenant in one of the shops, everybody is a taxpayer. Uh, so that, that needs to be clear as well, too, just to, to answer that point. Um, so anyways, I, I just want to make that clear. And then also, you know, one of the things that uh, I did say at the last public meeting, we'll have an open house because I think it's important. And uh, I know Councillor Kittress, you missed the last uh, information piece. If you can please attend because there's a lot more information we can share and just to get into some of the future exciting things that are happening. Because uh, there is, there's, there's quite a... a uh, a lot of plans, again, some of this in the planning stage, but this is a, a great instrument to say, how do we support some of these, these public pieces uh, that will be um, planned for the future? Anyways, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, councillors. I'm going to read the recommendation and then we'll go around uh, one more time. Uh, that the Council of the Township of Santa Juanita approve the tax increment equivalent grant application submitted by Laura South Inc. and that the Council authorizes the Chief Administrative Officer and the Managing Director of Corporate Services and Treasurer to execute a tax increment equivalent grant agreement between the Township and Laura South Inc. based on the contents of report COR 2021-41 dated July 26, 2021, and that Council authorizes the Chief Administrative Officer and the Managing Director of Corporate Services and Treasurer to execute an agreement between the County of Wyington and the Township regarding County participation in the Laura South Inc. Tax Increment Equivalent Grant. Can I get a mover for that, please? Councillor McRae, seconded by Councillor McWain. Uh, last discussion we do, we have a call for recorded vote. So we'll go around the table one more time and then I'll turn it over to our clerk to do the recorded vote. Councillor Foster. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, Aaron, as well for your report and, and your, your comments. Uh, and we all know that CIP grants are a very, very valuable thing. They're a very, very valuable tool that we have to provide an incentive to developers to, to make positive contributions. And I'll be happy um, to see that incentive uh, get approved, but only when and only when we know what the project is going to be. And as of today, we do not know what the project is going to be. Um, as I said earlier, it keeps changing. Um, it, it begs the question, how can we possibly approve tax relief when, uh, for a project when we don't know yet what it is going to be? And this is why I have called it premature. We, uh, we need to have a clear answer. And, and Councillor McRae, Councillor Dunsmore, I'm sure you'll agree with me that you both undertook and asked for uh, important information. Uh, Neil, I believe you asked for a, another public meeting. Um, Ian, I believe you asked for a, a 3D modeling. Those things have not yet occurred. We also need to know, uh, uh, we don't yet have a proper site plan with, and, and nor uh, ha has this uh, development even been approved. My view is that this is premature because we do not know yet what the project is going to be with, with certainty. And therefore, how can we possibly consider a, a TIG grant when we do not know what is exactly the, the end uh, result? And with that in mind, uh, Mayor, I'm, I'd like to make a motion that we defer this matter uh, pending the public meeting and pending uh, those undertakings that were made at the public meeting be completed uh, pending full public engagement 
uh, this matter is premature and it needs to be deferred. So I'm making a motion that it is deferred. Okay, so a motion to defer uh, does not allow for discussion. It does need a seconder and then a vote. So a seconder to defer this. Councillor Kittress, and I'll call the vote. All in favor of deferring this? Opposed? And that is defeated. Councillor Van Leeuwen? Thanks, uh, through you, Mayor. Yeah, one, one of the things I think um, is important for us to remember also is this TIG program is based on a percentage scale. So irregardless of what, uh, regardless of what we build uh, or is built, we, it's based on that percentage of the taxes after assessment. So it's not like we're giving or handing out dollars uh, that, that we have to somehow fund. It is looking at and saying, uh, once you've built it, and this is key, you build first, we receive a portion of, and we receive the taxes so it's, it's like a guaranteed, you're not walking away with money, you're not dragging your feet. Once it's built, then we will look at it and you get a percentage. And I think that that is key there. And that's why I'm okay today also to pass this before the project is completed because uh, this doesn't kick in until it is completed on the percentage scale. Thanks. Councillor McElwain. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I don't really have much to add from what I said the first time, just to, um, Councillor Foster says we don't know what it's, the final is going to look like, and, and he's absolutely correct. But I don't think that's what we're voting on today. We're, what is, we do know that, and what has been approved, we know what that's going to look like. And the site plan has been approved for a, quite a lot of the project, total project already. And work is going forward with that. And so the Teague should also be going forward for those pieces of it. Um, when the last phase that uh, from our uh, June meeting, yes, June meeting uh, comes forward again and it gets approved or it doesn't get approved, it really doesn't matter because there's no payment made if there's nothing built. So um, we're just approving the the Teague based upon what has already been approved and what is going to be built. And uh, so uh, there, there's, as I said earlier, there's no reason why we should not be approving this. Councillor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I personally would like to have the information of what we're voting, like the whole plan uh, present um, when we're giving the TIG. I think that um, we are, when people make applications for CIPs, they give us very specific what they're spending them on and how much it is. And same with the TIG, it should have all those. Um, the plan was changed um, from last month and now it's, a new one. Um, I'm in full support of, of them moving forward, but I think that having all the information is the, is the proper way to go. Um, I have, that's just what I would like to say. Councilor Dunsmore. Yeah, the, the TIG was set up in 2015. They've been moving forward. They've got a site plan. They asked for changes a month ago those changes aren't coming now. They've been withdrawn. Whatever they do will affect the value. The value will affect how much we get, how much they get rebated back. But to change the program now midstream would leave us looking silly to other people. Those lands that we have listed on that registry would not be purchased and developed because we would prove to those people that we're not trustworthy. We won't stand by our own Teague program. So uh, there's no other choice here but to vote for this. And I appreciate the fact that you're developing that property and you did it under the Teague and we'll honor our ob obligation. Councilor McCray. Thank you, Mayor Linton. I mean, to date, I have to say that we have benefited from Pearl's development of the North Shore. And while there are some changes we'd like to see in terms of development of the South Shore, 
still the reputation to date is that they've been very upfront in terms of putting money forward and, you know, building some pretty um, first rate projects. I mean, I've seen what other developers have done where they'll pay the bare minimum to put something up. Whereas here we're getting the Cadillac version. And I think it's important to remember that part of this agreement that we're voting on is basically a handshake agreement saying that we are supporting each other in developing those South lands. We all agree that what's there now is not great and we'd like to see something better. And we have an agreement with a developer who has proven to want to put in Cadillac versions of um, buildings. What he's done to date has really improved the North Shore. So I'm certainly in favor of this. The only thing I will comment on is one of the things that seems to really upset the public is the proposed bridge that you want to put, put connecting the North Shore with the South Shore. To a lot of people, that seems to be a wall that cuts us off from seeing the tooth of time. So if there is any opportunity to do away with that bridge, I think it would be a great sign to the community that you're really listening to us. Although to date you have been listening to us in terms of taking back your current design and reconsidering uh, the building heights. So that's all I have to say. Thanks councilors. I will uh, turn it over to our clerk to do the recorded vote. Carrie. Uh, through you, Mayor Linton, uh, Councillor Van Leeuwen? Yes. Councillor Foster? We don't know where we're going. We don't know the way. I give it a no. Councillor McElwain? Yes. Councillor McRae? Yes. Councillor Kittress? Councillor Kittress? Oh, is he frozen? No. I have a question. Uh, we're in the middle of a recorded vote. No, we'll do the Are recorded you? vote first. I'd like to abstain. Uh, an abstention is a, is a no. Uh, Councillor Neil Dunsmore? I vote in favor. And Mayor Linton? In favor. It is carried. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Council. Uh, thanks, uh, Aaron, uh, for being here today. Um, thanks, Vince, for your delegation. Um, uh, it's be good to get uh, this project going. I know um, we're excited about uh, what you can do on the south side, demonstrating what you've already done on the north side. So thanks for coming in today. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Moving on to 11.2 business park strategy report, uh, switching you up before we do that, let's take a five minute break. Um, yeah, sorry, I meant to do that and then forgot. So let's get back at it at 3.40, please.
Okay, we'll call this meeting back to order. It's 3.43, uh, three uh, extra minutes there. Um, and the next item on our agenda is the Business Park Strategy Report. Um, and that's coming from our new Manager of Economic Development, but I'm going to let uh, Brett uh, introduce uh, George to the group. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, George Boravilos uh, to you all. Uh, George was recruited uh, after uh, our previous economic development officer uh, retired. George has a lengthy background in economic development. He's been the uh, involved in economic development with the city of Kitchener, the city of St. Catharines, the county of Northumberland, and for the past several years had been uh, the regional uh, director with the uh, economic development program for OMAFRA. So pleased to introduce George Boravilos. Thanks, Brett. Over to you, George. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Linton and members of council. And thank you, Brett, for the introduction. Um, I'm just very pleased to be part of the township of Center Wellington's team. In the past three weeks, I've had the opportunity to engage with a number of staff, as well as key uh, uh, community stakeholders. Upon reflection, the Economic Development Strategic Action Plan is a very important document that lays out the foundation uh, for the community to move forward. And in that a document, there are a number of key objectives. Objectives, And one of those is we're, we're gonna to discuss today is outlined in the Business Park Strategy. Uh, the strategy, as you know, has been prepared by McSweeney and Associates, which has focused on four fundamental elements. And I believe Eric will be speaking to those four elements in detail. I also will say that the objective of the whole park is in alignment with council's corporate strategic plan, which is to establish a strong local economy. That economy also is reflected in what we mean by creating new jobs, new investment, as well as economic impact of those investments in order to protect and encourage in the growth of the public good. And so with that in mind, I think that sets the stage for the report. And if I may turn it over to Eric with your direction, as well as there's a number of delegates who will be with from the Economic Development Task Force will be speaking to the report. Thank Thanks very, very much, much, George. And over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, George. Um, I'd like to share my screen and uh, just walk through a brief presentation with you. Here we go. Um, why a municipally owned business park? Um, one of the primary uh, reasons is that it fulfills multiple center Wellington policy requirements, particularly those of the official plan, including one of its major goals, which is to encourage economic growth, to provide employment opportunities and tax revenues. Further, there are other requirements of the official plan. The township must ensure that adequate supplies of serviced industrial lots are readily available and to provide the necessary infrastructure to provide for the needs of growth and investment. These are just a couple of statements, but there's 
another three or four statements that are similar in nature um, that support uh, engagement of the municipality in the business park development. Further, the economic rationale is that employment land is a key contributor to economic development, to the employment base, to the economic, economic sustainability of the community, and the prosperity of the municipality as well as the private sector. Very briefly, um, we did a significant analysis of what types of industries are best suited for the municipality. And in one, one slide summary is we've recommended target industries um, in five different uh, categories, food and beverage manufacturing, equipment, metalworking and machinery manufacturing, organic and medical chemical manufacturing, a number of professional services and information and cultural industries, all of which are well suited to uh, Center Wellington, to the proposed business park, and uh, to the labor force in the surrounding area and, and Center Wellington that would support these industries. In terms of market and location analysis, um, the market analysis um, indicated that the pandemic has had relatively little impact on the industrial market throughout Ontario. However, um, or, or and as a result, there is a regional scarcity of service employment lands, particularly those lands that are in the one to five acre size. And as a result, prices are uh, rapidly rising um, and it is supported by strong and growing demand. So the demand has not slacked off on the industrial side. Local businesses would grow if suitable land was available. In terms of historic demand, the historic demand as documented by an earlier consultant was 59 acres per year over a 10 year period between 2008 and 2018. However, as the availability of supply of land has declined in Center Wellington to virtually uh, one or two lots, um, there has been obviously a decline in demand um, or that demand simply can't um, exhibit itself because there is a lack of supply. Planning, design, infrastructure and servicing of the business park. Um, the vision for the park is that this park will be upscale in comparison to other industrial areas. It will capture pent up demand and focus on owner occupied small lots. It will have a customized zoning to meet the municipal employment object objectives for this area and to meet market demand. That business park zone, the new zone, would be a mix of office and light industrial uses. It would result in a high quality business park and it would be supported by the 2015 urban design guidelines. Uh, the report outlines the specific types of uses that would be permitted and to further uh, define it, also less the number of uses that would not be permitted. In terms of phasing, the first phase would see an extension of Dixon Drive in an easterly uh, direction to meet up with First Line Road, uh, which provides an option for a few larger lots, about three in the order of six to 12 acres. Uh, should, those lot, should there not be demand for those six to 12 acre lots, a second phase can be developed, which would divide that land up into a number of smaller lots. So that is an optional second phase. In terms of property administration, management, marketing, um, the employment land development policies provided in the report go beyond just the business park itself, but would apply to all employment lands um, within Centre Wellington, whether or not they're in this park or not. So it establishes a number of policies with respect to how these lands will be developed. It also ties together um, the economic development reserve fund so that um, the um, employment lands development, the acquisition and development of employment lands can be self-funded uh, utilizing the economic development reserve. It also would support other types of economic development uh, related capital investments. The sales pricing policy um, would establish that lands would be sold at fair market value. And of course, fair market value needs to recognize that um, the municipality has a number of 
um, uh, policy objectives to be approved to be uh, achieved in se in developing and selling these lands, and they are reflected in the terms and conditions of any sales, and this does have a, an impact on fair market value, although for most businesses that are um, meeting the need I mean, sorry meeting the the uh, policy requirements, it it does not uh, discourage them from from buying and, and developing the land. Um, the uh, council would annually approve uh, based on a report from staff and market information, a sales pricing schedule. So a schedule would prescribe the asking price for all of the lands that are currently available for purchase. So council would review that on an annual basis um, staff would be dele have dele delegated authority to increase the price should market conditions warrant between council approvals. In terms of um, employment lands uh, sales policy, uh, council would approve and in fact it would be a formalization of many of the existing internal sales procedures and all offers uh, to be considered would follow the approved policies and procedures that are course approved by council. Authority to accept offers would be delegated to the CAO. That um, delegated authority extends only to those offers that fully meet all council policies and procedures. A summary of sales would be provided to council on a regular basis. The terms and conditions to meet municipal objectives would be secured by a standardized uh, form of offer and an agreement of purchase and sale to be developed uh, with legal expertise to secure those interests of the municipality in the future development of those lands. In terms of marketing priorities, um, number one, there have been a number of inquiries, uh, not only why we worked on this project, but in the short time since George has been in place, uh, requesting and information and when will the land be available. So the first priority, those businesses who have uh, made, made it known that they are interested in the land. A second priority would be allowing other center Wellington industries um, where we expect that there is a pent up demand, uh, the opportunity to expand or to relocate within the business park lands provided that they uh, meet all requirements. And thirdly, um, the attraction of businesses within the target industries outside of center Wellington primarily through the uh, use of uh, real estate brokers. And I'll take any questions. Great, thanks very much, Eric. Um, before we go to questions, we do have um, some members of the Economic Development Task Force here, and I just wanted to give, they've been working on this for a long time, so I just wanted to give them an opportunity to make a comment. Um, firstly, we have uh, Don Valerie, who's the chair of our Economic Development Task Force. Uh, we have Jim Gibbons, who has been a former mayor of uh, Fergus and has been around the block, and he's, uh, I want to give him an opportunity to speak to this initiative as well, because he's been, he's been uh, interested in this for many, many years now. Um, we also have um, uh, Don Valerie, a member. Uh, of sorry, I mentioned him already. We have Bob Cameron, a men uh, member of the Economic Development Task Force, and we also have Rick, Rick Whitaker, um, who heads up our Wellington Waterloo Futures, who's also a member of our Economic Development Task Force. So I wanted to give them just a, a few. They've been working on this for a while, so I wanted to give them just a, a couple minutes each to uh, talk about this. And we'll start with uh, um, with uh, former Mayor of Fergus, Jim Gibbons. Jim. You're still muted, Jim. Okay, should be able to hear me now. Yeah, we're good. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, the, the council for uh, starting or picking up on this program. Um, I know I've been involved in uh, industrial development in Fergus over a number of years, but I can't take the credit for the idea of the town developing uh, an industrial park that goes way back before me to Mayor Milligan and the people that bought the Harper farm and brought in all kinds of industry. <clears throat> when I came on to council, 
I just uh, continued on in what they had done and had been very successful in adding a lot of industry to our area. But unfortunately, over the years, the uh, official plan, the industrial land got uh, bought up by speculators and uh, they went to OMB and got it rezoned and that land was lost. And for that reason, we weren't successful in attracting much industry in the last few years. And um, however, this council went ahead and uh, uh, bought land and uh, this will prove very successful in the future. And I'd like to say thank you for it because uh, it's something that I wanted to see done for years and years. And this was the first council that ever listened and I, and, and I very appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And thanks for your involvement on the Economic Development Task Force. It's great having your history on that group for sure. Don Valerie. Thank you, Mary Linton. Um, just a couple of words is uh, I've been on chair of economic development now for six years. And uh, one of the things when I started was uh, Kirk McElwain was talking about marketing and business park. And that's exactly what we've done. Um, we've, we've got a business park, it's, it's a great layout. Um, McSweeney uh, have done a tremendous job on the report. Um, thank you, Council, for buying the land. And this is the next step. And I look forward to being part of it, rolling it out. And uh, thanks again, Council. And we look for your support. Thanks very much, Don. And thanks for uh, your last six years of being on this committee. I appreciate your community leadership for sure. Bob Cameron. Sorry, usually you can't mute me, Mayor, but thank you, uh, Mayor Linton. I, uh, like Don, have been on this committee for, I guess I found out just now it's six, I thought it was seven years. So uh, it's been probably the most rewarding thing we've done volunteering. And I think Don would agree just to be able to create jobs so that our community doesn't become a bedroom community and that we really balance that whole residential and non-residential tax base. <clears throat> and the last term we had different members of council. And I just wanna, like Don said, make sure that we took their feedback as we did all of this work too. As Don said, Councillor McElwain encouraged us to look at new jobs and a newer economy and how would we best market this to attract the right jobs to Centre Wellington. And I hope Mayor or Councillor McElwain, you see that in this report. Uh, Councillor Kittress, uh, with last term was a key driver in this economic development. And he constantly give us advice that if you don't have dollars and don't have a budget, you're never going to get there. And you sometimes need to control your own destiny. And I don't want to put words, I don't know if those were exact Steve Kittress's words, but I think you'll see that in here as we've continued. So now with Councillor Dunsmore and Councillor Van Leeuwen on the committee, I think we've got, we're on our way. So as long as, you know, what we see in this, Councillor Foster and Councillor McRae, that it's meeting all of council's needs. I absolutely appreciate, like Don said, that council had the foresight to buy the land in the first place, had the fire the foresight to allow us to hire McSweeney. It was an, a, a great process. Uh, they added tremendous credibility and context uh, and give us comparatives in other markets and other towns that we didn't even know about and certainly did it with great speed. So I'm hoping that uh, we've answered everyone's needs. The staff have done an amazing job. Um, so I look forward to your approval. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And thanks for your involvement on the task force since, since day one. Really appreciate it. Um, Rick Whitaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Linton and Council. Um, 
I'm, I'm coming from this from an outsider's point of view, from the community futures point of view, where uh, we provide uh, services to business, businesses and uh, provide financing. And we get requests constantly for businesses who would like to locate here. And, and here means Guelph, you know, Center Wellington, Kitchener, everywhere. Uh, and there's no land available. So this is really exciting from our point of view because um, the typical uh, process for us is that we get businesses who start here and want, would like to expand here and, and, and grow the employment population, but there's no uh, land to do that. So they migrate to Guelph. And then uh, when they uh, grow out of Guelph and would like to come back, there's no uh, land available for them to expand back here. So um, this kind of a project will uh, incredibly uh, be incredibly valuable to the community uh, from both the business side and the employment side. Um, the one thing that I uh, would like to just suggest is that there is some um, inclusion of uh, startup type of uh, accommodations for businesses like the uh, business condos that you have up on uh, Gartchorb so that there are businesses that can start and then businesses that can grow in the community. But this is really exciting from our point of view because we're excited to uh, provide financing to local businesses. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rick. And it, it really is good to have your broader perspective on the work that you do as part of the task force. So we really appreciate you um, speaking today as well. Um, turn it over to questions, uh, uh, comments from members of council. Uh, Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And thanks to the uh, gentleman for joining us today. It's great to have you uh, and hear about some of your thoughts on the matter. Jim, it's, it's particularly it's great to see you. Um, Jim was uh, former mayor of Ferguson. He was a mentor to many young people, myself included, Jim. Uh, uh, so it's really great to have you here. Um, a couple of comments, uh, Bob Cameron, you mentioned uh, the importance of jobs and that we're a bedroom community and, and I couldn't agree more. That is an issue. Jim, you also mentioned uh, land speculation. Um, that too is a possible uh, issue that, that uh, gives me some concern. So I guess with that pretext, my, my question uh, would be to our CAO, Andy Goldie, Andy, what steps can we take or, or may you take to ensure that land speculation doesn't occur and that the number of jobs created is an important consideration when you're looking at offers to buy these lots? Those are two key points. Andy? Thank you, through Mayor Linton. Um, um, we have a number of those steps currently on some of the lands that we've uh, sold with regards to speculation. We've actually just had a property that was returned and resold uh, with those conditions. Uh, as uh, in the report, we have a number of policy items and criteria and conditions that we will be including in all of that work. Uh, part of the recommendation or part of the report also speaks to ensuring that uh, we create a template uh, for purchase and offer a sale, which will address all of those issues with regards to the timing, um, not allowing land speculation that they did not uh, develop the site in a certain time period, uh, that they have to return it to the township. Um, so there will be a number of items that will be included in those agreements that will be coming forward to council as a template uh, to allow staff to proceed with uh, negotiating and finalizing uh, land sales in order that we do not lose one uh, property um, or employer coming to the town that wants to have a quick turnaround. As many of council know and the public knows, usually when somebody's made a decision to come to the township or expand, they're wanting to do that very quickly. Um, so we're wanting to have a very quick and expedited process that will still ensure confidence in council that uh, we're doing all the due diligence. Those items are being outlined uh, and Eric spoke to them a number of them in the presentation. Um, so we have a very good uh, feeling and knowledge that uh, we'll be able to protect those interests of the municipality. Eric, is there anything that you want to add uh, from the report on that point? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that we, um, the report refers to um, uh, the formalization of a number of procedures and um, those, those procedures um, and requirements and the terms and conditions have been outlined 
um, for inclusion in, uh, you know, a, a lawyer would look at these and see the best way to include them in an agreement of purchase and sale and secure council's interest in achieving the municipal objectives in a in an appropriate legal manner. Thanks, Eric. Follow on question, Councillor Foster. Thank you, Mayor. My my question would be to Eric Swinney. Uh, um, I, I, it's really important that we see jobs created as uh, some kind of an evaluation criteria when selling these lots, Eric. How how best can we achieve that objective when considering the lots? Will it will it be uh, one of the important things when uh, receiving an offer? It's not one of the criteria to determine whether or not a business would be permitted. Um, whether or not a business would be permitted to go there is really dependent upon the zoning. So if it fits into the zoning, it would be a permitted business. And you heard the representative of the CFTC talk about the importance of having the ability to accommodate startup businesses. Many startup businesses are one or two people and they may only occupy a few hundred feet or a thousand square feet or 2000 square feet. If you want to encourage these types of businesses, they're not necessarily high employment uses. Um, what we have done, Councillor, for land extensive uses and think of um, building material storage yards, think of um, contractors storing outside equipment, think of the crane company, um, auto, uh, secondhand auto parts, auto salvage yards, building materials yards. These are all land extensive uses that uh, they may have some employment, but they're not, um, they're not using the land in terms of the services they're made available. So we would encourage many types of uses to locate elsewhere within the municipality, should there be uh, space for them. So Typically, employment is not one of the criteria because you cannot draw a hard line in the sand and say only five or more employees or only X number of acres per hectare. Um, these things go up and down and sometimes they will gener generate a whole lot of spin-off jobs that you will not be measuring. So they might have 10 employees within municipality, but there might be another 40 or 50 supported in other businesses. So it's a, it's a difficult criteria to use in determining um, whether or not a business should be permitted. And I'm not aware, and we work across Canada, of any municipality that successfully uh, has chosen to successfully and has successfully utilized employment as a criteria for determining whether or not a business should be permitted. Rather, it's compatibility with the local area, with the municipality, and is it fit with the type of industries that you want to grow, attract, and retain? <clears throat> Thanks for uh, that, Eric. I just wanted to add to that on pages 16 to 18, there's a list of permitted land uses and a, a list of land uses not permitted. And I know the Economic Development Task Force had a significant number of discussions about um, those different types of land uses. And one of the criteria um, that we that was were used by the task force um, in the permitted uses and the not permitted uses was the potential level of employment. So that was something that built its way into into those um, those lists that you see on pages 16 to 18 of the report. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thanks through you, Mayor. Yeah, um, I'm very thankful that you pointed out the uh, the list of uh, acceptable uses and non acceptable uses. It was uh, a lot of different discussions happened around that, um, which is very important because again, as uh, Councillor Foster also referenced, creating jobs is important to us. Uh, if I think back all the way, I believe it was 2010, I was on economic development with Councillor McElwain and we were already speaking about what do we do with uh, municipally owned uh, business park? Is this a good idea? Should we speak about land and purchase? So this has been a topic that's been around for a long time with uh, with this council as well. So, and I think that we all care about the jobs. We wanna create uh, and help create jobs, but the important part is 
we are not the job creator in the end. And we want to take away every single uh, hurdle for business owners to try to find land to start their, their new business or expand their business. And hopefully this does that exact thing. It, it allows uh, business people, business owners to say, you, in Center Wellington, we can stay where we live. We don't have to go out of the community. That's important to me. And in the last year, I've had quite a few people already contacting me saying, when's this coming on board? How is this going? So uh, how do I even get a hold of uh, this land? So hopefully we see a lot of uptake and I'm excited to see it get going. And thanks to the committee and council for working hard on this. Thanks. Councillor McElwain. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I uh, haven't been involved in this uh, quite as long as uh, former Mayor Gibbons, but uh, it's been a long time since, uh, I think when I first went on to economic development back in 2006, we were already running out of land and started looking for uh, adding adding uh, development land. So it's really good to see that it's happening. And it's even more promising to see that the plan is to create, to um, try to attract businesses that are, would be more considered in the creative economy as Richard Florida called it, which is uh, really, I guess what, um, I've been referring to a, is a business park environment for for many years now, because um, that's where the growth is more than manufacturing, as manufacturing has been defined over the last few decades. So it's good to see that's happening. Um, I did have a couple of questions, um, Eric. Uh, this is just a clarification because. Uh, uh, I think I saw on one of your charts that the take off of land over the last 10 years has been 50, 58 acres per year or something. And I don't know where that number came from because we haven't had 58 acres for 10 years. Um, so I was just curious what what that number was that I saw in your chart. In your chart. It was um, an average number over the 10 year period and it was uh, in the previous report done by, um, I'm hoping that either Andy or uh, one of the staff can help me out with the name of the consultant here. I'm drawing a blank at the moment, or okay. perhaps the mayor. Okay, uh, it, it was just a clarification more than anything. I guess really what my question or comment was that I was, uh, was more interesting to me is the I noticed that marketing dollars were considered to be a low priority. I guess uh, it, late in 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 your uh, presentation, you had said that there's minimal marketing dollars or something of that nature. And um, both when uh, Councillor Kittress and I were suggesting that economic development needed more money. For, for a number of years, it was mainly focused on marketing. And um, so I'm, I'm just curious uh, why we aren't, yes, I know that there's some low hanging fruit locally already, so to speak, but we're gonna have to market outside of the area as well. And, and we wanna market to specific industries. So I just don't want to see our budget on marketing be too low to be effective, I guess is the, really what I'm suggesting. I, I hear your concern. And to answer the first question was Watson and Associates, the 2017 report. Um, to answer the question on marketing, we think you're going to have your hands full just managing the sales process and uh, guiding through the businesses through the development process of their lots. Um, in the, in the first couple of years, we don't think it's going to take more than two years to sell out, and the marketing um, would not be like a, a widespread marketing campaign. But um, I think your most cost-effective and efficient way of marketing outside of the area would be through regional ICI brokers, 
um, both within the region and let's say into Toronto if you've exhausted those. But I really don't see the need to do sort of, you know, magazine, television, or any other kind of advertising or marketing. I think you do it through the real estate intermediaries who will bring you the sales once they know of the opportunities because they are desperate in trying to find land for a lot of their clients. And you really don't need to go beyond that. If you do, I'd be very surprised. You can cross that bridge when you get to it. Councillor Kitch Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, delegations, uh, former Mayor Gibsons and uh, Don Valerie and Bob Cameron and Rick. Whitaker, um, thank you for your inputs. Uh, yes, uh, I was on the economic development and I feel uh, encouraged by moving forward here. I've always wanted to have more <laughs> business land for Fergus and for Center Wellington to expand. Um, I um, helped uh, suggest the uh, OLG funding for this and I am very encouraged by the report that we will be selling out uh, uh, and we will have no problem uh, selling these properties uh, and so I'm very encouraged by that. I do have a question for the CAO on how he will handle a developer that will want to put on a, put in a office uh, tower or a uh, multi-unit uh, uh, facility and how, how, how that will be handled because that could be qualified as specular, speculator. So I'm just wondering um, how that will be handled. Andy? Sure, you're Mayor Linton. Uh, I'm not sure how you see that as speculation. Typically we look at that as a, a person that wants to come in Immediately develop into Rick's point is providing those facilities uh, that will help to start up. Um, you know, our challenge right now with many of our private sector lands is um, nobody coming and building on the properties until they have one individual that's going to purchase and run a business. We are hoping that we're going to be having some people come in, build some spaces for entrepreneurs and new businesses to come in uh, or even expansion of existing businesses. What we interpret as speculation is, is that they purchase the property and try to flip the property. Um, that's not something we're going to be allowing to do. Those will be in conditions that we have not allowed in our recent land sales uh, for people to do that. So uh, we will be excited to encourage people to come in, uh, do a development and have provide spaces for small businesses, offices, starts up and things of that nature. But we will not be allowing people to come in, purchase the property and hoping to flip it in five or six years for additional property values. Follow on Councillor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so if a, if a developer comes in and um, wants to um, purchase the lots, um, put in uh, 50 units um, and then resell those as individual condos, um, you'll be fine with that. Um, I think that's what I heard from the economic development team that, uh, they, that those are spaces that we are needing. Uh, I know the one out on Gartshore is full. And we've had a number of those businesses come to us and say what they need is their next growth, move out of that smaller space and go into a larger space. So, yes. Councillor Dunsmar. Yeah, I, I just want to take a minute again to thank the members of the committee. And uh, McSweeney and Associates, Eric, your people did a great job on this. We kind of held your feet to the fire timeline. And um, getting you guys to push this uh, quickly as you did and your expertise I think was uh, fabulous and I appreciate your guidance. I'm happy to see this finally come through. I'm looking forward to businesses expanding and new businesses coming to town. And I'm really pleased with the, the building into the, the pricing prology and uh, strategy that we 
we can purchase back if they don't develop quickly to stop speculation and land banking. I think that would kill this project. So that's a great idea to have that. And I'm looking forward to get going. Thank you. Councillor McRae. Thank you, Mayor Lennon. I have no questions at a, as it is a comprehensive and understandable report. It's great to hear it has captured the ideas of councillors McElwain, Kittress, Van Leeuwen and Dunsmore, as well as members of our economic development committee and staff. Thank you to everyone who contributed to this um, fantastic strategy. I look forward to seeing it implemented. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor McRae. Thanks, councillors. Um, I'm going to read the recommendation um, and then we'll go around the room one final time. Uh, recommendation of the Council of the Township of Centre Wellington adopt the business park strategy prepared by McSweeney and Associates dated May 2021. Mover for that, please. Councillor Dunsmore, seconded by Councillor Van Leeuwen. Uh, final comments from Council. Okay. Uh, I will call that, I'll call that uh, to a vote. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. And I just want to take a second to uh, thank uh, uh, Eric McSweeney, uh, thank uh, Nancy for your work. Um, you guys were great uh, consultants to work with from, from day one. Um, you, you exceeded your the due dates on everything that you had to do, recognizing that we wanted to get this going as fast as possible and get a shovel in the ground as fast as possible. And you accommodated that. And um, the report is, is excellent. Um, and I think Councilman McCray uh, said it perfectly. It's comprehensive and uh, and understandable and it's sometimes hard to get both those in the, in, in the same sentence and I think you've done that and it's been a pleasure to work with you. Uh, I know that, that I share the comments of the Economic Development Task Force and the subcommittees that were set up to work with you. Um, appreciate all their work as well and thanks uh, to the four of you from the task force for coming uh, today. Thanks for all your ideas and, and, and wrestling through this with the, with the group. I know um, we had a lot of the discussions that we've had uh, today in the group and it was good to have that opportunity to talk to some of you who are business leaders in our community and really make sure that we came to council today with something that was that we thought was practical, something that we thought was going to work uh, and something that was in the best interest of our community. So thanks to our Economic Development Task Force for all the volunteer uh, hours that you put in uh, to this. Uh, I also wanted to thank council for uh, being visionary and, um, and moving ahead on something that is so critical to this community and that's bringing jobs and investment to this community in a very uh, com competitive environment. We're competing against neighboring municipalities and we're doing something now that is putting us on the map and we're doing something now that's going to drive jobs and investment to Center Wellington. Um, and that's not easy to do. Um, it's, it's, it's taken a while to get to this point, uh, but it's because of, of the political support that we have here to get this job done. So uh, this is an exciting day for us as we move ahead and stay tuned. There'll be updates as we go along um, and hopefully uh, we, this can move as fast as we're anticipating um, and we can get new businesses with new jobs to Center Wellington. So thanks to everybody that was involved in this. Okay, moving on to 11.3, appointment of municipal law enforcement officers. And Carrie, is there anything that you wanted to identify with this report? Uh, well, I think the report is fairly self-explanatory. We, uh, council will recall at the May 25th meeting, they appointed municipal law enforcement officers for the purposes of uh, parking. And uh, due to some scheduling conflicts and staff turnover, there is a need to add additional names to, to that roster, and that is what is simply before council today. Okay, so pretty straightforward here. I'll read the recommendation, um, and then I'll get any questions that people have. That the Council of the Township of Centre Wellington authorize the Mayor and Clerk to execute a bylaw to appoint various employees of Alpha Technology Systems operating as Alpha Parking Solutions as municipal law enforcement offices for the purpose of enforcing the Township's parking bylaws. Can I get a mover for that, please? Councillor Dunsmore, seconded by Councillor McCray. Any questions for that item? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. 
Uh, we have uh, one information item, emergency pairs, uh, uh, that were done on Fergus Well 57, um, and I and I you have a report in front of you from Dino. Is is there anything that you want to talk about th there, Dino? You're still muted, Dino. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton, and through you, Your Worship. Uh, this report is provided as information to Council regarding the emergency capital projects as required through a purchasing bylaw. Uh, these capital projects were needed for repairs to the riser pump and packer at Fergus Well F7, as well as various repairs needed for the Fergus wastewater treatment plant. Um, further information is contained within the report, and I welcome any questions from Council at this time. Great. Thanks very much, Dino. Any questions with this report, Council? Okay, I'll read the recommendation of the Council of the Township of Centre Wellington receive as information a report on emergency repairs completed at Fergus Well F7 and Fergus Wastewater Treatment Plant as outlined in report number IS 2021-15. Mover for that, please. Councillor McCray, by Councillor Foster. All in favour? And that's carried. Thanks, Dino. Moving on to bylaws, we have three bylaws there and I'll read a recommendation that bylaws 2021-35 through 2021-37 be read a first, second and third time and passed and signed by the mayor and clerk and the corporate seal affixed. Move for that recommendation, please. Councillor McAway and seconded by Councillor McCray. Any comments, questions about those? All in favor? And that's carried. We have a notice of motion um, from Councillor McElwain uh, that you have in your package that we'll be uh, talking about in September, in August. Okay, so next council meeting in August, and that will be introduced by Councillor McElwain. We'll have discussion about that motion in August. It's there for as as a notice right now. I have a confirm uh, confirmatory bylaw that the bylaws twenty. 21-38 to confirm the proceedings of council at its meeting held July 26, 2021 be introduced the first, second and third time and passed in open council. Mover for that please, Councillor Dunsmore, seconded by Councillor Van Leeuwen, all in favor? And that is carried, motion to adjourn. Councillor Kittress, seconded by Councillor Van Leeuwen, all in favor? And we are adjourned. Thanks and have a good rest of the day.